Now, in our discussion of atmospheric composition, we'll talk next about something that's absolutely vital for life and actually drives all of life on this earth or the vast majority of it. But if it was left completely unchecked, it would fry all of us and there would be no, no life on earth without the atmosphere. And that, that thing itself is of course light. So the sun emits a whole spectrum of cosmic radiation and much of that light gets filtered out by the atmosphere before it ever reaches the Earth. So if we look here at a brief uh, diagram, so here this is showing only uh, the UV light and thankfully gamma rays and x-rays that are shorter than uh, UV light, those get filtered out generally high in the atmosphere and never make it to uh, never make it to the ground level. But the region of light that we tend to talk a lot about when we're talking about atmospheric chemistry is UV light because some of it gets filtered out and then some of it doesn't and makes it all the way down to uh, ground level. And sometimes that's a problem and other times not. And then of course beyond uh, longer wavelengths than UV we have the visible light which we're grateful doesn't get filtered out uh, so that we see that every day. And, uh, and then there's also of course infrared and uh, radio waves as well. But we'll focus our attention on UV light because some of that gets filtered out here in the stratosphere and in the troposphere. And for UVC, even some of that filtering occurs before the stratosphere. So UVC or UV light itself, ultraviolet light, is split into three regions. There's UVC, which is about 100 nanometers to 280 nanometers. UVB, which is then from 280 to about 315, and then UVA is about 315 to 400. And of course, you've probably heard of some of the problems with UV light, uh, and then sometimes its usefulness in, in certain applications. Let's take a quick look at this. So UVC light tends to get filtered out in the atmosphere. So none of the UVC light makes it to ground level. And that's actually a very good thing. It's filtered out primarily by um, nitrogen and just oxygen in the atmosphere and it kind of in the upper regions of the atmosphere. So uh, nitrogen will absorb wavelengths less than 120 nanometers and oxygen does as well. And then between 120 and 220, so really in that low region of the UVC light, that's filtered primarily by O2. And then in the stratosphere, in the lower portion of the stratosphere part, primarily, there is a layer of O3 or ozone. I'm sure you've heard of the ozone layer. We'll, we'll talk significantly about it in this chapter and in chapter two. And this ozone layer is responsible for a lot of the UV filtering that occurs. So between 220 and 320 or so, so much of the UVC and then um, also most uh, essentially all of the UVB as well is filtered by ozone. And so we know that no UVC light makes it to ground level, but depending on the amount of ozone that's present, since it's the primary, the primary um, atmospheric uh, gas that filters UVB light, if there's not a ton of ozone present, some of the UVB light actually makes it to ground level. And thus, that ends up becoming a problem, as we'll talk about a little bit later. And then above 320, uh, the UVA light is largely not filtered by absorption, but more filtered, uh, sometimes that light is more, um, that light does penetrate down to ground level. Some of it is filtered or reflected off by cloud cover, et cetera, just as kind of the longer wavelengths are. But UVA is less of a problem as we'll uh, understand in a little bit. So how exactly do these different components filter off the light that is incoming? Well, it does it by absorption. So if we look here at, the, at an absorption spectrum for O2, we'll remember that on the y-axis is essentially the extent of absorption or how strongly it absorbs, and on the x-axis is the wavelength. So we can see here 
although O2 may have a fairly low uh, absorption extent, you can see these numbers are quite, uh, quite low, through the whole column of the atmosphere as light enters, it will encounter a number of O2 molecules. We'd calculated at the barrier between the stratosphere and the troposphere that there was somewhere on the order of 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th molecules of O2 just in regular air. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of O2 that the light encounters, even if uh, the relative extent of absorption of each individual O2 molecule is quite low. And you can see it absorbs primarily here between about, you know, uh, up to about uh, maybe 200 at the most or so, and then it really drops off. And that's uh, corresponding also to what we see kind of in this table over here, where O2 really only filters light up to about maybe 220 or so. If we look at ozone, on the other hand, we see that below 220, there's not a lot of absorption. But then we have a, we then have uh, significantly more absorption between 220 and up to about 300, maybe tailing up to about 320 here for ozone. And so the light as it comes in is absorbed by the uh, by the ozone molecules and then dissipated in some form. That energy is dissipated, as we'll talk about in a little bit. So. Why exactly do we worry about UVB light coming through the atmosphere? We're happy that UVC light is completely cut off, but UVB light, some of that gets through if the ozone layer is thin. And the reason for that is if we look at this third absorption spectra here. So here in black is the absorption spectrum of DNA. And you'll notice that DNA absorbs somewhere down here around, uh, starting maybe around 350, we start to see absor absorption at shorter wavelengths. And so if that light, that UVB light that comes in here right around 315 or so, or a little bit below that, if that UVB light is not filtered, then it's possible for some of the DNA in our skin primarily to absorb that light and then undergo unwanted chemical reactions that results in malignancy and eventually skin cancers. And you can read quite a bit more about that in your textbook. So that's some of the main concerns. But a question that might pop into your mind at this point is what exactly is it that makes UVC light and UVB light worse than UVA light, because UVA light is mostly unfiltered. Much of that's entering uh, through the, all the way down to ground level. So what is it that makes that light okay and the UVB and UVC light not? The answer to this is again, a fundamental general chemistry answer, which is energy. Remember, based on Einstein's relationship between wavelength and energy, we can see that wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. So at long wavelengths, the energy is relatively low, but at short wavelengths, such as the UVB and UVC light, the energy of those instant photons is high. And then that energy can drive um, undesired reactions uh, in your skin or uh, in your eyes, uh, leading to cataracts, or in uh, other, uh, or just other uh, plant uh, chemistry as well that may be undesired or may lead to malignancies. So let's just take a quick look at at some of this and and go a little bit more detail into this relationship between energy and wavelength. So here in this equation, we've got E is equal to H C over lambda. Remember, lambda is wavelength, E is energy, but H and C, that is Planck's constant, and then the speed of light. And we're familiar with those, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, and C is equal to 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But we have to make a few modifications here for our purposes to make it a little bit uh, more convenient. So make a couple conversions to take these to more useful units. So rather than joules, we often talk when we're dealing with chemical reactions about kilojoules or specifically even kilojoules per mole. And when we're talking about light, we really don't talk about light in terms of meters. We talk about light in terms of nanometers. 
So if we take a first uh, Planck's constant, we can simply make a quick conversion between joules and kilojoules, and that's just a factor of a thousand, so divide by a factor of a thousand. And so now Planck's constant, we can say is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 37th kilojoule seconds. Speed of light, on the other hand, uh, here we want to go from meters to nanometers. So the speed of light actually goes up to, well, it doesn't change at all. We're simply changing the units, but it's 2.998 times 10 to the 17th nanometers seconds. And so now if I take HC and now multiply them together, I will come out with one unit here is 1.986 times 10 to the minus 19th kilojoules nanometers. Now, that is the contribution from HC of one single photon. And thus, energy is equal to 1.986 times 10 to the minus 19th kilojoules nanometers per lambda, or over lambda. Now, that's, as mentioned, only the energy for one photon, and that one photon would be absorbed by one single molecule. But we don't talk about chemical reactions on the molecule scale. We talk about chemical reactions on the mole scale. And so what we need to do here is we need to calculate, okay, if this is the energy for one photon, what would be the energy, what would be the corresponding energy if I were dealing with a mole of photons that would be absorbed by a mole of molecules? So I can talk about this on the molar scale. So to do that, I multiply this value by Avogadro's number, which is generally expressed as inverse molar, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, something per mole. So we put it as inverse molar. If we multiply this, we come up with a new equation for energy, which is E is equal to 119,627 kilojoules nanometers per mole per lambda. And so now we've got an energy relationship on the mole scale. So let's take this and apply it specifically to UVA, UVB, and UVC. So let's just compare the energy of, uh, say, a mole of photons from UVA at 350 nanometers versus 300 nanometers, which is in UVB, versus 250, which is in UVC light. So UVA, essentially, you just take this 119. 1,627 kilojoules nanometers per mole and divide by 350 nanometers, we come out with 342 kilojoules per mole. If you move to UVB, we're only moving 50 nanometers, but you'll notice we go up uh, quite a bit, actually more than 50 kilojoules per mole. And if we move another 50, we've gone all the way up to 479 kilojoules per mole. So, what exactly is, uh, so again, what, what exactly makes UVC and UVB light worse than UVA light? Well, it has to do with the fact that these energies, particularly the UVB and UVC light energies, are in the same range as the enthalpies of reaction for many chemical reactions. So this is enough energy to be able to drive chemical reactions in some cases. UVA light, sometimes the UVA light can also drive chemical reactions, but it's lower in energy. And so uh, there are less chemical reactions that it's able to drive. So let's maybe go through a couple examples of this. And hopefully it will help clarify. So let's just consider a simple chemical reaction. We've got water, vapor, and let's just say we wanted to split off one hydrogen atom from this. So we just go to H gas, not H2, just a single H atom, and that leaves you with OH uh, as, or hydroxyl radical. We'll talk about it much more, but if we do this up in the atmosphere, just split it, we can actually go through and determine the enthalpy of this reaction and then figure out what would be the maximum wavelength of light that might be, uh, that would have enough energy to drive this reaction? So we have to go back and remember when we're calculating the enthalpy for a reaction, we need to go back to another general chemistry topic, which is heats of formation. 
So we can determine the enthalpy of a reaction simply using heat to formation, which is generally tabulated data. So remember that delta H for reaction is equal to the sum of the heat to formation of the products minus the sum of the heat to formation for the reactants. And so if I just from data tables, if I look up and find that the heat of formation for water vapor is negative 241.826 kilojoules per mole, and the heat of formation for hydrogen atom as a gas is positive 217.998 kilojoules per mole. And you might pause there for a moment. You might say, wait a moment, Dr. McKenzie. I was pretty sure that the enthalpy of formation for something in its elemental state is zero. Well, that's true, but H atom as a gas is not the elemental form. H2 is the elemental form. And so here there is an enthalpy of formation for just H atom as a gas. And so then we also have the heat of formation for OH as a gas, that's plus 38.99 kilojoules per mole. So I take the products, add them together and subtract the reactants, and I come out with a total enthalpy of reaction of positive 498.814 kilojoules per mole. Now, the next question is, so, so this is the enthalpy, or in some ways, the energy required to drive this reaction. So the next question is, okay, what, what's the maximum wavelength of light that has enough energy to drive this reaction, that would have this corresponding energy? That's fairly simple. I simply take the equation I had before. Energy is equal to 119,627 kilojoules nanometers per mole divided by lambda. Well, I can simply rearrange that to solve for lambda and substitute energy in here, and I will come out with the kilojoules and moles will cancel, and I come out with a wavelength of 240 nanometers. So 240 nanometers, which happens to lie in UVC region, that has enough energy to cause the dissociation of water. That's probably not a reaction that we want to occur at ground level, particularly, we don't want water to be fragmenting into hydrogen atoms, which are very reactive, and OH uh, radicals, which is also very reactive. We don't want that to occur at ground level. And so that's one reason why UVC light is, and UVB light uh, are more of a problem at ground level. Let's do a couple other problems real quickly. Uh, and this is maybe make it a little bit more practical. So DNA contains many, many, many carbon nitrogen bonds. And the average bond dissociation energy or the bond enthalpy, again, this is a general chemistry topic here. This is the energy required to break the bond. But the average bond dissociation energy for an average CN single bond is about 350 kilojoules per mole. So what's the maximum wavelength of light that has sufficient energy to break a carbon-nitrogen bond? Well, the way that we solve this problem is we go and we look at our equation. So we've got E is equal to 119.627 kilojoules nanometers, oops, nanometers per mole over lambda. But we're asking for wavelength here, so we need to rearrange, which essentially just involves swapping the places of these two. So I'll simply rewrite this as lambda, 119.627 kilojoules, nanometers per mole over energy. If I know energy is 350 kilojoules per mole, I can take that, 119.627 kilojoules, nanometers per mole, divided by 350 uh, kilojoules per mole. Cancel the kilojoules, cancel the moles. Multiply this through on my calculator, and I'll come out with 119.627 divided by 350 is 341.8. 341.8 nanometers, or we could round this to about 342 
nanometers. 342, that's in the, that's certainly in the UV region between probably on the lower end or the shorter wavelength end of UVA light. Now we'll talk specifically about maybe why three, we'll talk next about maybe why 342 nanometer light isn't, won't necessarily uh, break carbon nitrogen bonds in DNA, but that is the maximum wavelength of light that has enough energy to. Second question here is, if we are given heat deformation data, can we calculate the maximum wavelength of light that could cause the dissociation of nitrogen dioxide into just nitric oxide and atomic oxygen? So first we need to write out the chemical equation, then we need to use the heat deformation data we're given to determine the enthalpy for, re for the reaction, and then we need to figure out what wavelength of light would have enough energy to uh, correspond to that enthalpy. So first, we're causing the dissociation of NO2 into NO and O. So NO2, and this is a gas, going to NO, also gas, plus just atomic oxygen. Now again, we're given now a table with heat of formation data. You might wonder why O is not zero, but remember that the elemental form of oxygen is O2, not a single oxygen atom. So my heat of formation data allows me to calculate the delta H for the reaction. So that's simply the sum of the product enthalpies or heats of formation minus the reactants. So here, products, NO gas, that's 90.2 kilojoules plus O, that's 249.2, and then minus NO2, 33.2. I might notice that we didn't use N here at all. Well, that's sort of a little bit of a distractor. It's not in our chemical reaction, so we don't need to use it. There's a follow-up question that may appear in the homework that involves associating NO2 entirely into its elements, so into N and into oxygen. And then we would need to have that information. So here we take the information we've been given, kind of work that through, and what we come out with is something along the lines of positive 306.2 kilojoules per mole for the delta H reaction. Now, now that I've got that, that's the enthalpy required to drive this reaction. It's positive, the reaction is endothermic. It would require this much energy in order for the reaction to proceed. So then we need to find what's the maximum wavelength of light that corresponds to that energy. Uh, so essentially we just take that energy, we substitute it into the equation that we had for part number one. So lambda is equal to 119,627, oops, 627, not 626, kilojoules, nanometers per mole, divided by 306.2 kilojoules per mole. And then we kind of work that through and we come out with about 390.7 nanometers for this. And so now we've got essentially, uh, we've figured out what the longest wavelength of light is that has sufficient energy to drive this reaction. Any wavelength of light shorter than that will have higher energies. And so it would also possess sufficient energy to drive that reaction. 